So here in South Florida, where I am right now, I love coming down here because the herping is amazing and there are so many awesome reptile facilities to tour. So I'm here at Devin Douglas's facility and not only does he work with some awesome adult Australian water dragons, but he is actually one of the few to get viable eggs and babies of the Australian water dragon. So we're gonna hang out over here, we're gonna meet his dragons and we're gonna meet his babies and find out exactly how he bred the Australian water dragon here in Florida. I'm Dave Kaufman and these are my reptile adventures. At Zilla, we are dedicated to the innovation of caging, lighting, and equipment solutions that provide proper husbandry for your pet's long and happy life. To see our entire catalog, visit ZillaRules.com. All right, Devin Douglas. You know, you are one of those reptile people that I have gone fishing with more than I've gone herping with. But uh, we're in your backyard here, and you have done something that very few other reptile people have actually done, and that is captively breed Australian water dragons. So this is their enclosure in here. How many water dragons do you have in here? I have one male and four females. So out of the four females that you have in here, you got two clutches from two different females. Yeah, so over the past few years of working with these guys, it's definitely been a long learning curve learning their behaviors, what they do like, what they don't like, how to cycle them properly. One thing I definitely learned is first year you get them into a new environment, they're not gonna breed. That it takes them at least like a year to settle down and get used to the new environment. Right. And big trick I learned helping cycle these guys is that they have to get cold. Right. Those winters have to drop. You can't get worried about them and bring them inside. You have to at least let them get down into the 30s and 40s, which it does in Florida, but a lot of times, you know, I've worked a lot with tinosaurs and other types of reptiles where you don't want to leave them out in that cold. You want to either give them supplementary heat or bring them inside, but with these guys, they really need those temperature drops to improperly get fertile uh, breedings going. So if you have a warm winter here in Florida, you're it's probably likely, not going to get yeah. eggs. Yeah, it, you can get eggs, but a lot of them will be infertile. Right. And it was kind of the problem I ran into last year, is it, we had a bit of a warm winter, and on the two cold snap nights we had, I got a little nervous and gave them some supplementary heat when I really shouldn't have. And But I still had some success with the females who have been here for two years, but the females that have only been here for one year, I didn't have a lot of success with. Gotcha. Now, all the, the five that you have in here, they're captive bred. Yes. And uh, so you got them from a breeder here in the United States. A couple of them. A couple of different breeders yeah, here in the United all, States. There's a couple different bloodlines in here. Gotcha. And all right, so that is obviously the big male. Yep. He doesn't have his orange colors yet. On his belly he does. Oh, he does. But not under his chin yet. Yeah. So he's got he's, a little bit of growing to do he's and a still, little more maturing this, to do. This is still a young male. Yeah, right. This is a young male. These guys get big. So this guy's only, I think, three or four years old now, and he's still got that teenage hormones that's going on right, that's right when he was younger he was a lot more handleable and then as he started getting this deep red in his chest he decided no more of that right and in the next two years or so he'll come back down and be handleable again right. these guys is just like the green iguanas they go through that teenage hormonal that's right stage where they don't want to be messed with I love that black uh, mask that they have yeah. behind their honestly, eyes. honestly I think it's what made me fall in love with absolutely them. I've seen pictures of these guys in Sydney and New South Wales and such, and I just, I absolutely fell in love with them. Yeah, these are incredible lizards. How are you taking care of your lizards? What are you feeding them? That sort of thing. Yeah, so that's one of the big things I've been learning with these guys is that they're heavily omnivorous and they will eat nearly anything. But you have to be careful about what you're feeding them because you can't feed them too much vertebrate prey and you can't feed them too many fatty fruits and lots of sugar because it just it messes them up and they can get obese or they can they will have lose fertility so a good mixture for these guys I've learned is mostly insects is part of their diet and being that these guys are a large lizard getting your hands on larger insects is a good move here in Florida it's not as easy but I, you know, everything from crickets, superworms, mealworms, hornworms, discoid roaches, uh, occasionally like waxworms, calciworms, whatever I can get my hands on. Variety is the key. Gotcha. And, and then as far as veggies and fruits? Yeah, so fruit I only do on occasion. And I've honestly found that they don't particularly like it all that much. Uh, like one or two of them will occasionally eat berries or strawberries, but the rest don't seem to care. But they're actually pretty good about eating their greens. Uh, I always offer daily 
I always offer greens. If they want it, they can get it, but they're not usually over over excited about it. And then a couple times a week they get insects. Gotcha. Except during the winter, that slows down a lot. Gotcha. As far as overwintering in, out here in Florida, yeah. are you giving them a proper brumation with the season? Are you feeding yes. them during that brumation? So I let them make that decision. It's definitely one of those things I've learned that just watch them. It's a lot of times they don't undergo a full brumation where they stay under like, you know, the tegus did. Sure. But they kind of, it's almost like a pseudo brumation where they will come up if there's a hot day. So if we have an unseasonally hot day in the middle of December, these guys will be up and looking at me for food. I'll give them a light feeding them, let them eat, and they'll usually go back down if it gets cold in the night or if it's cold the next day. Gotcha. So you basically give them an option, exactly. let them decide what they want. Yeah. If they're coming up and they're looking at me like they're ready to hunt, they know what's going on. Gotcha. They, these animals know what they want and know what they need. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hang on a second. Hey, Walking McNugget, quit pecking at my feet. So and back to the lizards. Yeah, it's not even just diet where learning was a big curve for me. It's also environment. I mean, one goes without saying, they're called water dragons. Provide them with a large volume of water. They love to swim. They love to soak. They are going to constantly use the bathroom in that water, though. So you have to figure a way that you can quickly and easily change that water frequently. Because they are going to soil their water constantly. Right. But, but it makes them feel so much more comfortable. I definitely learned that they like that. And one trick that I had to learn, and I had to learn to not freak out every time, is these guys will actually sleep in the water. Yep. They will spend the entire night fully submerged in the water, even during the winter. And a lot of times, I'm not surprised, though most of the water bowls I use are black, so they absorb a lot more heat during the day. And so that water is actually probably warmer than the air at night. These guys are way more arboreal than I would have ever thought. Right. I almost never see them on the ground. Once I put them in this eight foot tall enclosure and I gave them all the branches they wanted, absolutely very quickly, they would spend all their time up there. They sleep in the branches quite often, especially during the summer when it's not as cool. They sleep in the branches. One interesting thing I learned with these guys is that they will choose the thinnest and lightest branches to sleep on that would barely support their weight. Right. My best guess. Oh. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> into the water chute, yep. fly boy. Exactly what he loves to do. Yep. Jump right into the water. My best guess is that when they're sleeping like that, it's kind of a predator avoidance trick. So they'll feel a predator coming against these branches, and the second they feel them movement on that branch, they drop, and they're usually sitting over the water, and they drop right down into the water and escape. Um, I think you're dead on with that, actually. So, All right, so in contrast to the males, this is obviously one of the females. Yeah, so an easy way to tell these guys apart as they get older is the females have a much smaller head, a much lighter build, and their chest are going to be much clearer in color. They don't generally have a lot of the red on the chest. Now, that's not entirely true. One of my females here actually does have an orange chest but it never gets the deep red the males get. Right. And the eye masks don't generally reach all the way to the eye either. And some females don't even have the eye mask at all. But these guys are incredibly variable in color. Uh, I have one female who is just solid gray with a couple of bands, and then I have her, this is my favorite girl, I'll tell the others, <laughs> who's got this beautiful just mosaic color. Look at that. All down the body and through to the tail. That is insane. She also might be a favorite because she's a uh, handleable. Right, right. <laughs> right, she's the most personable. Yeah, she's a sweetheart. Oh, girl. But these guys, one thing I've learned with them is they are incredibly intelligent for an agamid. They learn routines and tricks so fast. They're one of the few agamids I've ever seen to recognize non living prey as edible food items. Because hmm. if I just leave a dead cricket in front of a bearded dragon, it'll never touch it. Right. If it's not moving. These guys can be trained so easily to recognize non-living prey as edible food items. That's really interesting. Yeah, and I actually, it started with the male. I had trained him by consistently putting all his food in the same glass bowl. And he was always used to anything that went in that bowl was food. That's all he ever knew. So when I started putting non-living prey or veggies and fruit into that bowl... 
he would eat it without hesitation. So a little shameless plug here. Recently, I started a brand new fishing channel. You can check that out. The link is in the description below or right there. Devin and I just spent three amazing days fishing out here in South Florida. So if fishing is your thing, pop on over and subscribe to my brand new fishing channel. End of shameless plug. Let's get back to those water dragons. All right, so these are the outdoor enclosures that you keep your dragons in and you constructed this. Yes. Yeah, we constructed these here at home piece by piece, frame by frame. And we mostly, um, here in South Florida, you run into issues with hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So we made every sure everything here has hurricane straps all over, as well as all the wires extremely secure. These are actually four by fours, not two by fours. So we made sure everything was rated up to at least category five. Nice. So if the biggest storm comes through, these cages aren't going anywhere. And honestly, we already had our biggest test because we had our mango tree cut up a bit. And when they were cutting it, one of the biggest branches of the tree fell and hit this cage. And the only thing it did was pop about four squares of wire. Wow. And it hit directly on the frame. Wow. And all it did was it just popped a little wire that I did a quick repair and I just have to take this panel down and replace it. And that's it. Wow. So how do you get around issues? with like nose rub, for instance, on this side. Uh... Yeah, so these guys are extremely notorious for it, especially just like sailfin dragons and just like the Asian water dragons. These guys are really bad about nose rub. And the biggest thing to help prevent that is one, space. You give them a lot of vertical space. So these are eight foot tall enclosures, as well as they're also eight foot deep, which is much bigger than the general recommended size. Right. But that works great. And then the most important trick is that this is actually poly-coated wire. So this is soft to the touch. I'm not tearing my hands apart doing that. Right. Therefore, they're not tearing their noses apart if they run against it. All right, so we are indoors in your herp room here, and obviously you're not going to keep lizards this size outside because you have a lot of rat snakes in your yard, and that would make a tasty treat for a wild yellow rat snake out there. But look at these cute little guys. <laughs> Wily little guys. Oh, yeah. Still a little squirmy at this age. But yeah, so this... This would leave to be a little girl, and this one I think is a little guy, especially because you can see on his chest there, he's starting to get he's that red. Starting to get that, yep, that reddish orange there. And this one has almost no pattern near the eyes, and actually looks almost identical to Pretty Girl, which is this one's mother. Looks almost identical to her mother. Yeah, look at that mottled pattern coming through. Mm-hmm. So I'm very excited to see this one grow up. Yeah, absolutely. So now, how old are these guys? So these guys just passed four months old. So they're almost exactly four months old at this size. And you can even start to see where the males kind of get a bit of a bulkier build right. than the females do even at this age. They're a lot thicker and bulkier. Their heads are starting to get a little bigger. So even at this age, they're a bit sexually dimorphic. So now at this age, they're eating basically the same thing that the adults are eating. Oh yeah, 100%. From even when they're little. Now when they're younger, I feed them a higher quantity of insects than the adults and not as many greens but they're kind of getting to the age where it's almost uh, they're the same as the adults where they're mostly getting greens and then insects several times a week right and it's almost the same exact diet as well it's you know crickets mealworms superworms roaches anything these guys aren't particularly picky right now these are obviously diurnal lizards so yes. you're giving them a uv supplement absolutely yeah so it is extremely important for these guys to have UV, they are an active diurnal lizard. They are constantly exposed to it. They need it for healthy development. And so I keep pretty high-end UVs on these guys. It's still tropical UVs, but closer towards desert. They do get a lot of UV exposure in the wild. And I've actually been uh, starting to experiment with the, uh, the Vivtex. Absolutely. I always say, what Ryan and Erica at VivTech are doing is revolutionizing UV lighting for reptiles. It absolutely is. When yeah. I started putting it on these guys, I started noticing this more green and beautiful coloration on them. They were a lot more dull under the standard fluorescent tubes, but I noticed so much more color coming in on these guys now. Absolutely. UV is so important for reptiles. So outside we were talking about how important it is to give them clean water at all times. They will follow their water pretty regularly. So with these babies, you came up with a pretty ingenious solution for that. Yeah, so I did put a little filter in their water bowl. But honestly, what's been doing most of the brunt of the work here is I actually have a pothos plant, golden pothos, growing in their water feature. And that kind of does a double whammy for me. One, 
it eats nitrates like crazy and helps me filter the water a bit so it stays cleaner longer but also it provides cover for the babies because a lot of times like I said these guys take to the water whenever they feel nervous and they're gonna feel even more comfortable that there's a plant in the water they can hide under so they feel very very comfortable inside that pothos plant in the water and the plant itself is actually doing so well it's starting to grow out into the rest of the cage and I'm gonna let it take as much room as it wants in the cage these little guys will feel as comfortable as they can. So as you guys know, I love herping Australia, and one of my favorite lizards to see down there is in fact the Australian water dragon. It is one of the most common lizards that you can see around Australia, so if you ever get to Australia to go herping, you're bound to see one in the wild. But here at Devon's facility in Florida, it is really cool to see captive breeding initiatives of this incredible lizard. So Devon is rightfully gonna keep those babies to be future breeders, so unfortunately, he doesn't have any available at this time, otherwise I'd probably buy a few from him. But anyway, I wish Devin all the luck and success with his future breeding projects. Anyway guys, there's lots more reptile adventures coming up, so as always, thanks for watching. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on. <laughs>